So, McCarthyism, the untold truth. God, am I excited to talk about Joseph McCarthy. Joseph McCarthy was a man that grew up in the Midwest, on a farm, working for his parents, good old child labor, went to school, eventually joined to be a, to, uh, attempting to be a pilot in a World War II and ended up a gunner on the back and tail gunner instead and fucking got a lot of kills and then became a, um, you know, had a, had a bit of a political career, had a little few odd jobs, eventually went into politics, eventually became a senator, made some good friends while he was there. We'll talk about some of those friends. A lot of military friends, including, um, what is his name? Flair? Fal- Fal- I can't remember his name. I have to read it. But, true American. He's the anti commie base dude, right? Yes. He is the man that the term McCarthyism comes from. Now, let's get into the myths about what McCarthyism isn't. This is much of what we have been taught about Joseph McCarthy. The false narrative. Number one was that McCarthy was on a witch hunt. That he was looking for communists under every corner that were not there. That he was, you know, attacking innocent people regularly and bringing them out into the light and going after them. Before I get into this, a lot of this information is information I know. A lot of this information comes from a book, um, Blacklisted from History from a professor at Emory University. And a lot of this information comes from um, Stefan Molyneux. But I can't show Stefan Molyneux because he's banned on YouTube and I want to put this on YouTube. <laughs> so I might get the video like taken down or something for like hosting a video that's by a banned person. It'll totally get reported. Um, so we can't do like any reactions to his video. So instead, if you do happen to find a copy of his video somewhere, which, like, I can send you a copy, but it'll be deleted soon enough. Um, if you do happen to find it, you'll find that a lot of the data, a lot of the things are the same, and uh, he gives great commentary. Uh, if you find it on BitChute or something or on his website, you should check it out. He has several things, several videos, um, talking to authors of books about, like, um, the education system. He does a, he's done a ton of content. The movie Manchurian Candidate was based off him. <laughs> should let Peyton Storm rush after World War II. So, continuing on. Sorry, I just want to get that out of the way. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want you guys to be like, hey, I've seen, like, most of this stuff from him. Yeah, you have. That's where I got a lot of this information from, as well as the book, um, Blacklisted by History. So, the other myth is that McCarthy went after and attacked innocent people. That there were all these people that weren't communists, and that McCarthy was on this witch hunt to go after communists that he thought or pretended existed, and yet it was it was all a big red herring. You'll hear this all the time that it was proven that that McCarthy was wrong and that he was he was targeting innocent people and there was tons of people that weren't that they had their lives ruined, and we will prove that the major people that supposedly had their lives ruined didn't have their lives ruined despite being Russian spies paid by by Moscow. The next thing is the myth that you've kind of seen with the video we just finished watching, um, Razor Fist's rant, is that McCarthy used the power of the government against civilians, that he went after people in Hollywood, that he went after, like, regular people, that he went after, like, you know, journalists and, and, and was using the government to, like, destroy freedom of speech and freedom of thought. None of this is true. McCarthy didn't target any civilians. In his entire time, McCarthy only attacked the defensive force of the state against infiltrators from Russia. Spies. Known spies. And the last one is that McCarthy simply lied and that he promoted spying and attacking and going after fellow Americans and your neighbors. This is not true. Tying the Red Scare and the fear of Americans to try and oust their neighbors was nothing that McCarthy ever supported. And a majority of the things that lead up to, that get grouped in or forgotten with McCarthyism happen before McCarthy. A majority of this presentation is going to be about things that occurred before the 1950, the the, the 19, January 1950 speech in Wheeling, Wheeler, Wheeler, sorry, in Wheeler, um, West Virginia, where he first goes. 
In fact, that speech had recordings. The recordings no longer exist in the Library of Congress. There were newspapers that wrote about this. They no longer exist in the Library of Congress. No one can actually find anything but a transcript of said speech because the speech's audio recordings and the newspaper articles written about it disappeared. Quite a few things disappeared, as we'll, as we'll find as we keep going. But the most important thing to remember is that nearly every single one of these myths taught about Joseph McCarthy are lies. They are not true at all. They simply don't have any evidence of this. Well, they have some evidence, you know, like of the vindication from like one group or the vindication of one person. And yet ultimately we find that they were convicted by another group. If he was targeting civilians, why wouldn't he have targeted W.B. Du Bois? Yeah, right. I know it reads like W.B. Du Bois, but for whatever reason, he hated the French, the, the, the English colonial or the French colonialization of black names. So he preferred to say Du Bois. Maybe they're at the library of incongruent. Du Bois. <laughs> All right. So let's get into it. Historical context. So I think when, often when we think about the Red Scare, when we think about the rise of communism, we forget the history. Was the Red Scare as big as history made it? I find it odd how we're being paranoid and Yuri Bezmenov told us exactly what was happening and it still happened. We're actually going to react to a video about Yuri Bezmenov after this presentation, if you stay later on. Um, some like additional things from like Yuri Bezmenov. But the historical context, uh, I'm calling it communism on the rise. It's really important to understand that when we talk about Marxism and communism today, we're talking about an ideology that has um, that has that has infected academia and infected our culture and a philosophy that's rotting leftism today. When we talk about communism in the 1940s and the 1950s, we're talking about something totally fucking different. We're not just talking about the ideology. We're talking about an empire that had taken over most of Eastern Europe. We're talking about the Korean War from 1950 to 1953. In the 1940s, Albania fell to communism. Bulgaria fell to communism. East Germany fell to communism. Romania, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, North Korea, China, Syria. Communist influence was spreading in South America and in East Asia. Like, we like to laugh and meme about, like, the threat of communism and how dumb the Vietnam War was. But you have an evil and pernicious genocidal ideology that is sweeping the globe. And the only people that can stop it is America. W Europe is too wounded from World War II. Everyone is too wounded from World War II. There are only two people left with any real power as of right now. And that's America and Russia. Everyone else is crippled. And so th that's, that's what's happening at a time when people learn that communist spies have infiltrated every level of government in America. And I don't mean that as like a joke. I don't mean that as like an exaggeration. I mean that as literal American history that we are not taught. So, so try and put yourself in the mind of America pre the Red Scare and understand why the Red Scare occurred. Consider Korea War in 1950-ish. China enemy status holds true. We're going to talk about China. We're definitely going to talk about China. Because America is deeply involved in creating communist China. And by America, I mean Russian uh, communist spies in the State Department. Also a well-known socialist leader in New York. <laughs> All right. He was right about one, but he was not Russian. He was an American general in the United States Air Force with ties to the OSS and chemical weapons. Who's he? Gaina, Trump style. China. All right. China. China. I said, wow, I didn't even know. All right. This might actually be one of the few things Donald Trump does know about because, like I said, his mentor was Roy Cohn who is a lawyer for McCarthy, though he's not in this presentation because it's not really important. Even though he's an important figure, he's really just working with McCarthy. You, why would you redeem an Alex Jones impression right now? I, I will do the Alex Jones impression after. I'm trying to do like a somewhat serious 
I don't want to go into a full blown Alex Jones impression just a second. I think the timings. All right, I'll do it, Chad. I'll do it. You got to understand, I have the documents right here. All right, this presentation is full of documents. The goddamn chai comms were taken over because of Russian spies and and, and that were that were over in the State Department. You you know you know the people don't want to tell you the real world history of this. People don't want to tell you that you know they they love to talk about McCarthy. They don't want to talk about Huac. They don't want to talk about Hollywood. They don't want to talk about uh they don't want to talk about Whit Whitaker Chambers and the pumpkin patch papers. I've seen the pumpkin patch papers, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you, they are devastating. Actually, I do have the docs. <laughs> All right. I don't want to go too much into it. I don't want to do a big one. So while this is going on, we also have a certain psychological element that I think is really important as to why we were susceptible to being taken over by Russia. We were allies with the Russia, um, with, with Soviet Russia during the war. And so there's a really weird and uneven feeling um, between like Nazism and communism, right? You know, if you walk around with a hammer and sickle t-shirt or a Che Guevara t-shirt or something about Fidel Castro, you know, or some other pick your favorite revolutionary, there's not really a lot of issues you get walking around the street, right? You might get the occasional MAGA guy or, you know, America first guy to like make a comment or say something stupid but like, you're not like a threat that you're going to be hurt or anything. Try and do that with an SS shirt or a swastika. I can show a hammer and sickle on stream right now all I want. If I show a swastika, the stream gets taken down. Funny how it happens that way, huh? What is, what is, did I, what? Russia supplied tech advancement and nuclear ch technology to 19 China 1950s. This, this fact threatening China America relationship. Okay. I mean, it's a lot easier for the Russians. They're right there. No, I, we'll, we'll get into that later on in the, in, in the presentations. Talking about Roy Cohn, the orphans of the children of those Soviets says actually stayed at WDB's house for a while. That is so. Oh, the spies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I want to bring up something real quick. We'll go into this. But I think from the Russia side, it really shows what's really, I, I really want to show you some of this propaganda, right? And this is just Russian propaganda. I could show you American propaganda, but it's not, it's not that important. What's important to understand is that America was assaulted with a lot of propaganda to not really be afraid of Russia to begin with or the threat of communism. We were allies, and so we were working with them during World War II. We had a lot of close relationships. And in fact, communist spies, we, we now know from the Venona records, they were told to quiet down, to be supportive, to be um, helping America during kind of the World War II in such a way as to not cause problems with the capitalist West and instead ingratiate themselves and infiltrate themselves. But there was a lot in this. And so this is all Russian propaganda posters. Right. But the idea was to ally themselves against fascism and, you know, against Hitler and whatnot. Which boy do uh, boy do those Russians love their propaganda posters. Am I right? I mean, America wasn't really short on them during the 40s either. Yeah, no, of course. Slap a, you know, person. In the 90s, I wore a, red, a sweatshirt to South Philly, Street in Philly. Sounds bad. I had a goatee then. A guy came up to me and gave me a newsletter and invited me to come to a Communist Party meeting. I trashed it and didn't attend. <laughs> oh, you should have gone. Always find out what your enemies are thinking. Oh, right? But you get the point. I think it's important for us to recognize that there was a lot of propaganda. And it was from both sides, not just from Russia to ally ourselves with the Russians during World War II. I seen a truck today with Texas license plate and Confederate flag. I knew for sure he was packing heat. <laughs> Facts. Now, moving forward, what is leading up to McCarthyism? And, and there's a lot of slides on this. So Truman was elected in 1945, 
and remained president until 1953. Okay? Now, understand that McCarthyism, his speech doesn't begin. And this is a really important date, okay? Joseph McCarthy may have been like, you know, getting information or talking to people, but he doesn't present his case until January of 1950. And so you need to keep 1950 in your mind. McCarthy dies in 1957 at, um, at, Bethesda Hospital, the same place that his friend died, both under mysterious circumstances, and McCarthy never gets an autopsy. He, it's just assumed he died from alcoholism. At the same place that his other friend that was a uh, rabid uh, anti-communist that was, um, you know, working in a uh, general in the Navy also died. Um, you know, from somehow falling out of a 16, uh, from 16 stories. Uh, we'll get into that, though. So... Truman is elected from 1945 to 1953. This is a leftist, okay? Truman is without a doubt a leftist, taking over another leftist position. But even being a lefty, even being pro kind of like lefty philosophy and things like that, one of the first things he does is he signs Federal Loyalty Security Program Executive Order, right? Which allows people to fire anyone for treason or sympathetic association with communists, fascists, or totalitarians, quote. And from 1947 to 1956, for this very reason, under the Federal Loyalty Security Program, over 2,500 government employees were fired for this. Okay? So 2,500 federal employees fired for having a sympathetic association with communists, fascists, or totalitarians, which means they were part of the Communist Party, they attended a bunch of, they attended a bunch of meetings, or they were married to a communist or a fascist, etc. Truman is the best president, in my opinion. He set up our eventual victory against communism. We were staring down death with 70. Oh, my God. Oh, God. The status has entered chat. He was so great, even though he was enabling communists. Did Eisenhower see this uh, all happening, or did he not take a stance on it during his presidency? Eisenhower. I mean, he warned us against the prison military industrial complex. <laughs> right. Get them all, Uncle Joe. I would trade this Joe for our Joe. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah, Joseph McCarthy would be so much better. Joe who? Joe Mama? How is Truman enabling communists? Well, he, uh, Alger Hiss and Dexter White, um, the FBI reported to him several times that they were com communists, and he kept them in his cabinet, and he kept them in high positions of authority, knowing full well that he had plenty of information that they were communists. So how is he enabling communists? He was uh, 52 to 42 viewers in a second. Amusing Twitch meme. Yeah. Uh, Twitch plays games with our bandwidth and just hey, kicks At least games. we're able to hit 52 tonight. I changed some of the band, uh, the bit rate settings and moved the bit rate from 5,000 to 4,200 and use a different encoder to see if it might help by having a little bit less of a bit rate. And it seems to have helped like where they block our numbers a little bit. So hopefully that'll help out a little bit in the future. But they still cap our numbers unless we get like an overwhelming amount of numbers and then they'll cap it at the next point. It's fucking annoying, but it is what it is. So these are just some of the big things. And I don't want to bury the lead, right? I think one of the biggest things possible is something we can immediately talk about and is amazing to talk about. And that is this right here. So this is from Smithsonian Magazine. You heard Mark talk about this, so we'll get into that. <laughs> for his new car, right? It was also the 50s. A lot of people probably still believed overwhelming prosperity would win out. I don't know, man. So, spies who spilled atomic bomb secrets. As part of the Soviet Union's spy rings, ring, these Americans and Britons leveraged their access to military secrets to help Russia become a nuclear power. Despite being an ally during World War II, the Soviet Union launched an all-out espionage effort to uncover the military and defense secrets of the United States and Britain in the 1940s. Within days of Britain's highly classified decision in 1941 to begin research on building an atomic bomb, an informant in the British Civil Service notified the Soviets. As the top secret plan to build the bomb called the Manhattan Project took shape in the United States, the Soviet spy ring got wind of it before the FBI knew of the secret program's existence. So the Soviets knew before the FBI knew about the Manhattan Project. 
Barely four years after the United States dropped two atomic bombs on Japan in August 1945, the Soviet Union detonated its own in August 1949, much sooner than expected. August 1949, again, recognize the timeline here. Joseph McCarthy's speech in Wheeler, West Virginia, is January 1950. This is after Soviet spies had uncovered how to make the atomic bomb and stolen that from us. What kind of a stupid question is that, bad boy? I'm not here. I'm not here to talk about justification for one state or the other. What I'm talking about is whether or not McCarthy's myths about McCarthyism are true and whether or not he was right about the things he said. Like, like, yeah, obviously Russia had every incentive to do that. Like, why would I like what kind of an, what kind of an idiot thinks you can't hold two positions at the same time? The Soviets did not lack for available recruits for spying, says John Earl. Sorry, John Earl Hayes. Espionage historian and author of Cold War Spies, early Cold War Spies, what drove those college-educated Americans and Britons to sell their nation's atomic secrets? Probably money. <laughs> it was a big part of it. Uh, some were ideologically motivated, enamored of communist beliefs, explains Haynes. Others were motivated by the notion of nuclear parity. One way to prevent a nuclear war, they reasoned, was to make sure that no nation had a monopoly on that awesome power. For many years, the depth of Soviet spying was unknown. The big breakthrough began in 1946 when the United States, working with Britain, deciphered the code Moscow used to send its telegraph cables, the Nona. As the decoding project was named, remained an official secret until it was declassified in 1995. Because government authorities did not want to reveal that they had cracked the Russian code, Venona evidence could not be used in court, but it could trigger investigations and surveillance hoping to nail suspects in the act of spying or extract a confession from them. As Venona decryption improved in the late 1940s and early 1950s, it blew the cover of several spies. And they go on to talk about this. I'll send you this link. I'm not going to read the entire thing here, um, but... The Soviets absolutely had a, a, a ring of spies, most notably in the State Department, and they were able to, of course, obtain obtain our nukes. USSR didn't start cold. What? What? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and ignore Bath Boy because he's just a tanky troll, I guess. I don't know. Like, he doesn't care about what it, the content is. He's just saying that people are saying things they didn't say to then defeat said things. All right. If you guys want to argue with them, go ahead. We don't we don't like ban or time people out unless they break the US. So, moving forward. More things about leading up to McCarthy's. In 1946, State Department official Samuel Klaus issued the Klaus report. I think it was 120 pages, I believe. In it, he named 33 Communist Party officials that worked in the State Department and suspected an additional 90. Nothing happened. None of these people were fired. Despite there being a report about it, nobody got fired. No one was fired. These, these communist spies that were paid for or directly appointed by Moscow, nothing occurred. In 1950, Senator McCarthy learns of this memo. He tries to get a copy of the memo. Titterthy gets a copy. Another, another senator. And he supposedly gets a copy, and then it's gone. Nobody can find the copy. Nobody can find the memo. It just doesn't exist anymore. There's reports of its existence. Now, maybe the report never existed. Maybe it's just a bunch of people claiming the Klaus report existed. Except Klaus claimed later that it existed, and then he made the report, and yet nobody can find the report. Super important to get a cover your own ass folder, boys. Make sure you save documents. Sometimes the other people delete those documents. Or website those documents or and go down. Make sure you have a backup for everything. So nothing has changed. We got Swalwell sleeping with spies. <laughs> and Nancy Pelosi's driver. Was it Nancy Pelosi? No, it wasn't Nancy Pelosi. Whose was it? Whose driver? Was it Nancy? Do you remember, Mark? Mark. I'm listening. Well, I asked the question. 
Can you ask it again? Well, then you're not listening, fuckface. I think, was it Nancy Pelosi? It was, ah, it was Feinstein. That's who it was, Diane Feinstein. She had a Chinese uh, spy fucking driver for like years and years. Just drive, just chauffeuring around, seeing what they get. I think she took a lot of confidential phone calls in the car, something like that. I might be making that up. Who knows? I don't I'm probably know. making that up, to be honest. Don't, think <laughs> well, just, exactly. don't make up shit. I, something I thought I heard, and then it's like, oh, no, I just thought I heard it now in this moment. So, J.B. Matthews, um, reformed communist um, and um, government official, you know, he compiles uh, documentation for McCarthy of thousands of high-level communists and organizations. Now, when I say thousands, I don't mean thousands in the State Department. I want to make that clear. I mean thousands of communists in, like, media, in Hollywood, in, you know, journalist, uh, in journalism, et cetera, et cetera. So he's given all of these different people with, like, the potential to investigate. But, of course, McCarthy doesn't really go after Hollywood. He doesn't go after journalists. I mean, of course, there's the, you know, Asia situation. But other than that, he's not really worried about that. One of the top things censored in China is Mao thanking Japan for destroying China. <laughs> right? So, he gets, he gets documented. So, he learns about what we do know from what he stated in from declassified stuff is that he does not have access to the Venona documents, which we will talk about much later. But he does have access to J.B. Matthews' list. He does have access to the ability to start investigations and call in witnesses. And he does know that the Klaus report exists and he knows that there are claims um, from, from individuals in the State Department that the State Department is full of communist spies. So this is enough for him to go, we've got to investigate this. We've got to do something. And what he doesn't have is he doesn't have FBI records. He's sealed away from everything uh, J. Edgar Hoover is trying to do to stop the communists. And he's sealed away from the Venona documents or the Venona records, however you want to say it. So, again, leading up to um, leading up to this, again, 1950. Always remember that date when we're going through everything tonight. In 1950 is when McCarthy begins his crusade, if you will. But the Hatch Act of 1946 exists. And it disqualifies all communists and Nazis from all government work. So that's why it becomes really important to understand this kind of this like famous tagline you hear. Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Because according to the Hatch Act, McCarthy's not doing a crusade. He's not doing anything unconstitutional. He's enforcing the law of the land. It is illegal since 1946 for you to be a previous or current member of the Communist Party, and the same thing with being a Nazi. If you refuse to answer this question, it's not a burden of evidence that the state has to prove that you're a communist or a Nazi. There needs to be reasonable doubt. And if you refuse to self-incriminate, then you're, you should be fired. That's the law according to the Hatch Act of 1946. Uh, 55 million? Yeah, 55 million is a low estimate. For sure. How low? I mean, 50, I think, is like 76, from what I understand, is like the lowest est like the lowest estimate of the entirety of like communist China. By whose historians? By whose? You want me to like name the names of every fucking historian that came up with the specific no, no. number of 76? Not their names. What country is they're from? Oh, no, there was a period of time where, like, American historians and, and other people were, like, allowed in to do, like, research and stuff. Oh, shit. The uh, the loopholes are closing. Does the Hatch Act still exist? Yes, the Hatch Act still exists, but it's been, like, watered down over time. And so, like, technically speaking, you're not allowed to be a communist uh, member. Um, you can You can now work in government having previously been a communist. Or currently being a communist, but like you're not allowed to do like political speech. Like basically, the Hatch Act today is like if you do political speeches or like talk about your politics when you're supposed to be an impartial government employee, you can be fired under the Hatch Act. So you're supposed to keep your secret, your politics secret, and act non politically and not advertise your politics. So it's actually kind of it exists today, but it's been reversed. 
So you're allowed to be a communist. You're just, you have to keep the fact that you're a communist secret. Where originally it was, you're not allowed to be a communist or a Nazi. Like being gay in the military. <laughs> Silver Ogre already ahead of us. Dexter white ass. <laughs> so what's really important here is the necessity for Joseph McCarthy. Because the FBI is not able to prosecute anybody, right? The FBI is only able to investigate people. It requires either the attorney general or it requires a Senate or congressional committee. It requires a congressional, so a House or a Senate committee to do the investigation and to do like the kind of pseudo prosecution to expose these things so that they can be brought up on charges or that they can be fired, right? So what's really important to understand is that only Joseph McCarthy and only the House Un-American Activities Committee is actually able to do anything about this. So when people say that, like, he just went on a crusade and it didn't matter, well, like, if, like, what else was supposed to happen? And even more important is that the FBI told Truman in 1945 that Dexter White, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, was a spy. They told him that he, they told Truman, you have a communist spy in your midst and we have multiple sources. We have, we have the Venona documents. We have testimony from other defectors that this person is a spy. So what did President Truman do? President Truman kept him as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury and then promoted him to the Executive Director of the International Monetary Fund. He eventually went on to be a co-founder of the World Bank, and he eventually, and eventually he wrote the Brentwoods Initiative. Yeah, communist spy is the one in charge of like our loaning and banking world systems and like America uh, uh, dollar as a means of loaning to other European nations, loaning out tons of money to European nations by America. You know, happened under the. It's, all, it's almost like the communists had a vested interest in us giving a bunch of money and loans and 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 the dollar being associated and, and connected in a global government with Europe, tying us all to the kind of devastation of Europe. Like what? What kind of I'm just I'm struggling to find what kind of interest that could be at all. So it didn't start with Klaus Schwab? No, it started with Dexter White. So it's really important to know that that the other okay i think this is the next slide okay yes so here we go the fbi sent multiple warnings through the 40s including dozens about edward rothschild who worked in i want to say it was the government like printing office until the mccarthy committee fired him fbi was investigating and sent hundreds of reports so they were informing both top levels of the state department and President Truman, hey, Alger Hiss is a spy. Laughlin Curry is a spy. Dexter White is a spy. We are sending hundreds of reports of all of these different spies that we're finding. And low-level ones were eventually fired. But the really interesting thing is that at the time, you weren't blacklisted in government employment. So if you got fired from the State Department for being a Russian spy, you could just go get a job at the DMV. You could go get a job in the Treasury Department. You could go get a job in other less sensitive areas. You weren't like excised from the government. You were just a spy in another part of the government. This happened all the time where people would get fired from the State Department and then just move right into another place, despite being a known spy. And Truman didn't do anything to stop Alger Hiss, didn't do anything to stop Laughlin Curry, and didn't do anything to stop Dexter White. He basically passed, he, he, he told the FBI, quote, it sounds like a fairy tale. He just, presumably, he just didn't believe him. Sorry, believe uh, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was trying to warn him that you, the State Department and your own cabinet is infiltrated with Russian paid communist spies. And he just goes, ah, eh, sounds like a fairy tale. I mean, to be fair, Hoover was a bit of a, an issue. Yeah. Well, why, why is that? I don't know. Probably the cross-dressing. <laughs> oh, God. Yes. So 
it's important to understand that Truman is extremely complicit in at the very minimum of his negligence. Oh yeah, Churchill was all over FDR. FDR had a had a, a, mem a member of his cabinet that was a known communist spy as well. Yeah, FDR. Never mind. I go into too much. No, go go into it. I mean, this is also something I got from Stefan Molyneux, but apparently FDR uh, rerouted, or not necessarily him himself, but his cabinet rerouted uh, an estimated one billion dollars of supplies away from troops coming in from uh, Italy, and. Uh, transfer them to Russian troops and probably led to a lot of U.S. deaths. Mm, mm. Or at least a lot of suffering because it was cold as fuck over there. Yeah, fair enough. Curry worked with FDR to give Poland to the Soviets. I want to make that clear again. Laughlin Curry, who was the, the biggest spy in the FDR administration, was in constant communication with Moscow and let them know that FDR was willing to give up Poland to the Soviet Union before their negotiations. And so they already knew that if they demanded Poland from the United States, that the United States was willing to give up on that demand. If not for Laughlin Curry, Poland may never have suffered under Soviet regime. They may have never been a satellite country. And Poland's a really big deal because this is the beginning of World War II, right? The blitzkrieg into Poland and Nazism could have been a liberal democracy as far as Europe is concerned if, it's, if not for this one spy that was feeding information from FDR's cabinet to the Russians. Do you, I, I don't know. We're not very far into it, chat, but do you think maybe the history we're told about McCarthy being a crazy person that was just making up shit is a little bit off. Do you think? Do you think maybe there was a reason that that we had to excise these communists? I don't know. Maybe you'll build up a, a more substantial case here in a couple minutes. Well, here's the next one. The FBI was investigating all of these. Um, well, not all, but the FBI was investigating. Yeah, was also unironically from Russians. Yeah, in media that own media. Absolutely. So the FBI was investigating, right? Under, under the Truman administration, they were investigating spies in the State Department, as well as, you know, kind of everywhere, right? The FBI was going all around trying to find Russian spies, right? Well, funny thing, who oversees the FBI? And who is in charge of, like, exposing these things and bringing them to trial? The CIA. No. Obviously not, Mark. Don't mean. Who does that? The Department of Justice. So, yes, the DOJ, the Attorney General's Office, and Congress. These are the three people that can actually do something about spies working in the government. All of these people were locked and sealed from being able to access any of the reports and documents from these investigations by the FBI. So because of this, Congress, the DOJ, and the Attorney General's Office had no idea the contents of these investigations. I gotta get my robe. <laughs> All right, well, be quick. Don't fucking meander. Chop, chop. Well, fucking get it on, son. <laughs> don't, don't get mad just because I'm trying to stop you from interrupting our stream. It wasn't until you stopped. Yeah, well, obviously, I'm not. I'm going to stop. I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for my co's. Get chop, choppy. All right, so Congress and the DOJ and the Attorney General's Office all are unaware of the information from these investigations. Instead, they're being brought up from J. Edgar Hoover to Truman and to other individuals in the cabinet. Despite the fact that one of his cabinet members... Well, well, I'm sorry, not one of his cabinet members, his second in command. So his secretary, his assistant secretary of um, the Treasury is a known communist spy. Truman is saying it's a fairy tale and Congress is not able to get any of this documentation. So many of them have no idea that that at the very least, the State Department is full and possibly even controlled 
by commu- by Russian spies. The worst dictator the U.S. ever helped was Stalin. Absolutely. Way worse than Hitler. So, that that's just some of the things leading up to McCarthyism. But let's keep going. Now, in 1949, McCarthy says that he receives a report of communist infiltration of the State Department. Right? So this is not the J.B. Matthews, but a separate report from within the State Department. Whether or not this is true, we don't know. What we know is that he has a list. A list of, I think it was 101, 110. I have it somewhere else in the slides. So he has a list of a little over 100 people that are currently working in the State Department at the time or have worked at the State Department recently that are communist uh, spies. He says, I've got the list. Now, when you hear apologists... When you hear apologists say that he was proven wrong, what you will hear is that his number was wildly off, right? And that, like, everybody was cleared, and then, like, okay, some of them got fired or resigned or whatever, but for the most part, he had this big over 100, and, like, the evidence didn't pan out. Well, that's mostly bullshit, but, yeah, there are some people that may or may not have been cleared. There are some people that may have resigned. There's some people that moved, right? Um, But in his list of people, you know, he focused, I want to say it was on 60 some of those individuals that he that he had really good evidence and corroboration for. So despite having that big list, he didn't investigate every person on there thoroughly because some of them, it seemed like it was he said, she said bullshit. In June of 1947. The Senate Appropriations Subcommittee memorandum claiming security risks of homosexuals and communists in the State Department is put out. Now, when I say homosexuals, you might think, oh, my God, this is so horrible. Being a homosexual in 1947 is a security risk because it's illegal to be a homosexual at the time. Okay, so if you are a homosexual, um, you're a threat to you're a threat to security. Because you can be blackmailed. It's just like if you have really bad credit or you have really bad money problems, right? Like if your credit gets really, really low and you have really bad money problems, like you'll lose your security clearance or like some of your capacity or you'll be put on a desk at the FBI, for example. Because anybody could come to you and be like, hey, man, I can solve all your problems with $10,000 right now. Just kind of like, you know, tell me a couple things. Right. And you're just you're just much more easier to be enticed. It's the same thing with homosexuality in 1947, because if you're a known if you're like a secret in the closet homosexual and someone threatens to blackmail you with that information, you may give up state secrets um, in, in, you know, to keep that a secret. So in June 24th, Assistant Secretary of State John Perifoy, he fired 10 people. Five of the people were on that list. So. What we now know is we have documentation of communists on the list that are being fired from the State Department by the Assistant Secretary of State for being communists in the State Department. This is this is proven three years before Joseph McCarthy ever comes ever comes to fruition. Now, several departments fire a percentage of people for being communists, right? The FBI fires communists. The OSS fires communists. um, You know, Treasury Department fires communists. There are communists that are fired, like that, like like you know, a few hundred communists for a while in like like every department. They clean house, except interestingly enough, unlike hundreds of other departments, the State Department never fired a single person themselves from 1947 to 1950. Magically. All these other places are firing people for having ties with Communist Party or being married to somebody that was communist, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the State Department, oh, they're squeaky fucking clean. No reason to worry about a single person here. How convenient. It's very convenient. Now, in 1949, Alger Hiss in the State Department is found guilty of perjury. Now, we'll talk about this more later, but basically Whitaker Chambers accuses him and proves proves with documentation that he's a high-level communist spy. 
likely one of the highest level in our government at the time, other than maybe Dexter White. And, you know, people we don't know about, of course. Now, he is convicted of perjury because he says that he's not a communist spy. Um, we'll get into the details of that. But he's not actually convicted with treason because it was past the statute of limitations because he had infiltrated um, and done work on behalf of the communists since the 1930s. So he'd been there, you know, for 20 years as a communist spy. We we, that's, a, that's a long uh, shelf life for a spy. Ah, ah, hold on. In 1950, this is when America discovers that spies gave the Soviets the, the bomb. So you want to understand McCarthyism, you want to understand the Red Scare, you want to understand, you know, the House Un-American Activities Committee. You want to understand all of these things. You got to understand the historical context, the fact that we're receiving more and more reports that communist spies are infiltrating our government and that nothing's being done about it. And then we find out that those same spies, maybe not obviously the exact same spies, but spies in general, have given the fucking nuclear weapon to Russia. Russia, after it's taken over fucking half of Europe and it's influencing China and it's influencing the Asia, Asian world and it's influencing South America. Why didn't they go after Africa? There's no, like, what would it, what would that accomplish? They don't have any infrastructure. All the resources. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's not, not, it's just not, it's not as good of a target. I mean, if you're short-sighted. I mean, why do you think China's building there all the time now? Yeah, but that's, that's been like a 30-year plan. Actually, that's it's been since the 1970s, so a 50-year plan. And they still haven't, like, really secured all the resources. So, the next thing that happens, well, and it's not next, we're, we're hopping around the timeline, but I'm kind of going in a little bit in, in importance, is Amerasia. Now, Amerasia is a journalist, um, or, or uh, uh, not journalist, I think that's a, it is a pro-communist publication that is, um, that is um, basically talking about and reporting news on the, on the kind of the Asian continent, Right. So it's, you know, all most of its publication focuses on China, Japan, Korea, you know, Vietnam, Laos, all, all you know, the, the East Asian uh, arena. America is a superpower, a power unit that can do damage. African countries can just be satellited easily. They're not a threat. Yeah, pretty much. So AmeriAsia is this is this, you know, publication that is, you know, producing pro-communist, you know, propaganda and, you know, information which, you know, freedom of press, freedom of speech in America, that's fine. However, of course, the FBI conducts a raid on on the pro, uh, on them in 1945. And what they found is thousands of top secret government documents regarding the East Asian area and conflicts. What we also know is that Amerasia was funded by Frederick Field, who was a Soviet propagandist. It was their number one donor. So the number one donor is basically a, a satellite Russian propaganda uh, machine churning, churning out Russian propaganda in regards to East Asia. Talking about how wonderful the communists are and how horrible and mean the, the, the nationalists in China are. And like talking about how like only the communists are willing to fight Japan and they helped us fight Japan. And that like the nationalists will, you know, they won't do anything to protect us from Japanese fascism, et cetera, et cetera. And they have thousands and thousands of government documents. And this is happening in, again, 1945. So there was a State Department individual, Jonathan Service. Now, he gave these documents to Amerasia. He stole top secret government documents to give it to Russian Moscow funded Russian propaganda in America. Top secret documents, thousands of classified secret and top secret documents. So J. Edgar Hoover, he fucking prosecutes the motherfucker. He gets the information out. He goes after him. He grabs individuals from the Department of Justice, says, fuck you, we're going after this guy. This is like, and he has an open and shut case. He's got his signature. He's got, he's like, 
uh, he's got his signatures on the things. He's got his handwritings on the things. He's got documents that prove that like that they like that they went through his desk. He's got things that prove that like only he only um, uh, service had these, etc. Well, the Department of Justice fined Amerasia and returned service back to active duty in the State Department. Said nothing to see here. The DOJ just goes, nothing to see here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They committed high treason. They gave tons of classified documents to, to known Russian propagandists funded by Moscow. Don't worry about it. Here's your fines. And, uh, and you know, you know it, was, it was a happy little accident. Put a little thing in his report, like, you know, he had some disciplinary issues. Put him right back to work. On this day, uh, ex-agent committed a whoopsie doodle and uh, has been punished appropriately. Yeah. And then this was the book I, I told you guys about. You got to check out Stan Nevin's Blacklisted by History about McCarthy. So remember, everything that I've said so far leads up to 1950 January speech by Joseph McCarthy. So when you hear people say, oh, this was just a wild witch hunt that, you know, nothing was going on, like nobody needed McCarthy. He just started this out of nowhere. And then he just made up the threat of communism. All of these things occur before he ever comes onto the scene. And how public is all this at the time? Um, I mean, let's see. The Senate Appropriations Subcommittee is that we were with spies in, in, in there. Um, Alger Hiss in 1949, that was a, a giant wake up moment for America. Like, that's why people were like, holy shit. Like, like one of the top people in the entirety of the state department. I think he's like number three in the state department at the time has been a communist spy for 20 years and has been leaking our secrets. Okay, so like there's there's some pretty big tidbits getting out there. Right. It's not people just like giving in to like, you know, stupid panic. Like they don't know about Dexter White. They don't know about like FBI stuff. You know, they don't know about Laughlin Curry. Um, they don't know about, you know, the Truman like hiding shit. They know about the Hatch Act. They know some people get fired. That occasionally gets reported, right? And they but the biggest thing is, you know, uh, and also Amerasia was public. So people knew that there was like Russian propaganda like journalism in America that was funded by spies and that it had connections to the State Department and that it was under investigation and then it just didn't go away. That was a, Those were public hearings as well. So, so what's going on before this? Some things. Oh yeah, Wahoo Sam. We'll talk about Alger Hiss and new documents. We'll talk about... Um, uh, uh, Whitaker, Whitaker Chambers, and we'll also talk about the Venona Papers, which were declassified in 1995, as well as you know um, the Venona Papers, the Venona documents. Um, sometimes you'll see you know Venona Papers and then like Moscow uh, inter interceptions or transponders or transcoded or decrypted things, right? And then sometimes you'll just call them the Venona Documents or the Venona Project. So, China and our spies. This is really important. So, at least 50 million dead at this time, you know, in, in, by the 50s, by, by McCarthyism. Right? Now, State Department Ambassador William D. Pauley was asked after the fact, during like kind of like the latter end of the, of, 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 um, the McCarthyism kind of like investigations. And he, and he was stating that, yeah, it was completely infiltrated with spies. Spies were all over the place and deeply embedded, especially when it comes to East Asia. East Asia seems to be the biggest concentration of what the State Department's goals were, which is to say their primary goal was to make America not support the nationalists at all and to make sure that the communists took over China and then later make sure that the communists took over South Korea. That was their goal, was to, was to get America to stop, um, to stop, um, intervening and stop helping the nationalists and allow Russia to fund the takeover of China and Korea um, and obviously move on forward. So, 
Until 1946, we had allied with Chiang uh, Kai-shek. Okay? Now, Chiang Kai-shek was, was one of the people fighting against the communists. All right? We were funding them. We were giving them weapons. We were giving them, like, tactics. Who knows what the fuck else the OSS was doing? Right? Who, you know what I mean? Like, like, like we just don't know what the OSS... Oh, God damn it. Oh, it seemed to fix it. All right. Hell yeah. No, oh, my headphones going wonky. Sorry about that, boys. So we, uh, I don't know if you can hear it on your end, to be honest. So you don't know. Oh, well, I can't. <laughs> yeah, you're not hearing what's through my headphones. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we're allied with the nationalists. And then George Marshall removed aid to the nationalists to help the communists, another State Department official. Okay? So the State Department all of a sudden took a policy of doing everything they could to no longer help the nationalists in any way, shape, or form whilst Russia was still fi funding and helping the communists in China. Dexter White, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury under, under Truman, suspended $200 million in gold to Chiang Kai-shek. Okay, 1946. $200 million in gold. I'd like to have a slice of that pie. We were, we, we, were, we were really, really concerned with making sure that China didn't fall to the communists. And then all of a sudden, who cares? We shouldn't be involved in that. That's not our fight. Meanwhile, we're preaching about the encroaching communism. But the Red Scare hasn't, you got to understand, the Red Scare hasn't hit yet, Right? This is before the Red Scare. This is what leads up to the Red Scare. Like, people are still scared. Russia's a superpower. The populists are scared. They don't like communists, right? But it wasn't full-blown, like, Cold War, like it was, that like, the escalations that come later. Must be the reptilians moving the strings. And again, Dexter White is, like, number two to a cabinet position, the right-hand man to a cabinet position is a known communist spy by the FBI. And Truman says it's a fairy tale. I'm sorry, but the amount of evidence that was given to Truman, I can't say anything other than he was a communist fucking sympathizer. That or, you know, he was sick in the latter half, but that doesn't excuse it from 46 to 53. No. So, another spy working in the State Department that we, that we know about, is Solomon Adler. Solomon Adler was in China, and he worked with Dexter White from China to produce false reports and stop aid to Qing, and he lived with Qi Chaoting. So he lived with a Communist Party handler in China. He had a handler from the, chi from the Chinese communists that was his roommate, and he was reporting, oh, the communists are great. Like, he was working for the State Department, trying to give information so that the State Department could use these reports. And what they were saying is, well, look, the communists are the only one. And you got to remember, this is right on the tail end of them being our allies, right? This is right on the, right on the tail end of them being our allies. We're saying, hey, look, these guys, these Chinese, they're going to win. And not only are they going to win, they're the only people fighting the that are willing, that fought the Japanese and are willing to fight the Japanese. Those nationalists, they'll never fight that. They want to be they want to be isolationists. The China the Chinese communists, they're not really communists like like the way people are saying they are. Like he's he's wording everything in as much as possible to try and twist the idea that the Chinese communists are winning when they were when it was a stalemate and that they were great, that they weren't doing anything harmful, and that they weren't really full blown like Russia communists, right? They were like way less communists. Like, they're, that's just who they, like, they're, you know, they're just kind of like, you know, some lighter form. They're not that bad. And then they take that information to other spies, such as Dexter White. And Dexter White, as the Secretary of Treasury, is, is, is sitting in the room talking about where money should go and whether or not we should send aid and support to the nationalists in China or whether or not we should just, like, not spend money there because it's a waste of money. And he's in there like, oh, no, no, if you send the money, it's, we'll just lose it. Like, the Chinese are going to win anyways. They're not as bad as you think, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting how just the right person in the right spot can completely change the course of a war. So, 
right before the Dean Ackeson speech, the Lattimore proposal is adopted by the State Department. And what the Lattimore proposal is, is not only should we ignore China, we should also ignore Korea. We should send no money to Korea, and we should do everything we can to stay out of Korea. Okay? Now, the right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, it can. So, the Lattimore proposal is adopted. And in 1949, Dean Ackeson from the State Department gives a speech to the National Press Club and says that they will ignore Asia. And January 25th, okay? So this is two weeks. I'm sorry, I keep saying January, but it's I, I, I mixed up. It's January is, is the speech, uh, is Alger Hiss. Um, two weeks later in the beginning of February is the Wheeling speech in, um, in West Virginia. The day that Alger Hiss is convicted of perjury for lying about being a communist spy at the State Department, in the high levels of the State Department, Dean Ackeson supports him and says he's a great guy, says that, like, you know, oh, this is overblown, he's not really a communist spy, despite the fact that court documents prove this. It's when America sees a member of the State Department apologizing for a high-ranking member of the State Department for proving that they are communist spies that people are like, what the fuck is going on? And it is really important to understand that I I, I, I really believe this. I don't know. I don't know because we're not, we don't have a crystal ball, but it's very, very possible. And in my opinion, true that if, we had done more, and if Truman had actually listened to the FBI, how long is this Wheeling speech? We're going to listen to it. We're going to read it in a couple minutes. Very short speech. That if he had gone through with this, right, if he had just routed these people out in like the 40s, and if, and if, and if we hadn't been infiltrated this way, China would be a liberal democracy today. The Great Leap Forward never would have happened. And close to or over 100 million Chinese people would not have had to have been genocided. But America allowed our government to be infiltrated by communist spies to such a degree that Russia was pulling the strings of our foreign policy. Russia decided what America did and did not do in foreign policy before McCarthyism. I'm going to make that very clear. Then comes the Wheeling speech. Um... You guys asked about the Wheeling speech, so I'm going to skip ahead and go ahead and do it now. This is the Wheeling speech. Let me get a glass of water, and then I am going to... This is a transcript, to the best of our knowledge. There's some ellipses and some missed things, um, because there were recordings and there were transcripts at the time, um, but shortly after, they disappeared from the Library of Congress and they weren't put out again. And uh, we don't... All we have is, like, some newspaper clippings that people saved of the transcripts, but... The recording is completely gone. So let me be right back. I'm going to get some water because I'm going to read this speech. To you. That's probably one of the most devastating places to get a spy into is like an evidence warehouse or someplace like the Library of Congress. Just have absolute control over the history of what people ha know. Uh, yeah, Vietnam probably wouldn't have happened. At least not the way it did. Yeah, Vietnam, like, imagine if China, imagine if China was a liberal democracy. Not only would Vietnam not have happened, but neither would Korea. There wouldn't be South and North Korea. There would just be Korea. And China would be a liberal democracy. And Russia wouldn't have nowhere near the power to do half the shit it's done in the Middle East or in satellite countries. Like, if they hadn't successfully infiltrated the State Department... There is an argument to be made that there would be no communist regimes in the world today. So this is the Wheeling speech, West Virginia, February 9th, 1950. 
Dude, I try, dude. Like, it's panels. You got to pick and choose your battle. So, Wisconsin Republican Joseph McCarthy, first won election to Senate in 1946, yada, 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 yada. So, although McCarthy displayed this list of names both in Wheeling and later on the Senate floor, he never made the list public. I want to make that also true. We'll get into that later, though. <clears throat> I'm not going to do the voice like as Joseph McCarthy. I'm just going to read it as me, but I got to drink water because all this talking, you know, it rapes your throat. Let's go. Interesting phrasing. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, as we celebrate the 141st birthday of one of the greatest men in American history, would like to be able to talk to you about what a glorious day today is in the history of the world. As we celebrate the birth of this man, who with his whole heart and soul hated war, I would like to be able to speak of peace in our time, of war being outlawed, and of worldwide disarmament. These would be truly appropriate things to be able to mention as we celebrate the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. Also, little aside, fuck Abraham Lincoln. Five years after a world war has been won, men's hearts should anticipate a long peace, and men's minds should be free from the heavy weight that comes with war. But this is not such a period, for this is not a period of peace. This is a time of the Cold War. This is a time when all the world is split into two vast, increasingly hostile armed camps. A time of great armament race. Today, we can almost physically hear the mutterings and rumblings of an invigorated god of war. You can see it, feel it, and hear it all the way from the Indochina hills, from the shores of Formosa, right over to the very heart of Europe itself. The one encouraging thing is that the mad moment has not yet arrived for the firing of the gun or the exploding of the bomb, which will set civilization about the final task of destroying itself. There is such a hope for peace if we finally decide that no longer can we safely blind our eyes and close our ears to those facts which are shaping up more and more clearly. And that, and that, is that we are now engaged in a showdown fight. Not the usual war between nations for land areas or other material gains, but a war between two diametrically opposed ideologies. The great difference between our Western Christian world and the atheistic communist world is not political, gentlemen, it is moral. For instance, the Marxian idea of confiscating the land in factories and running the entire economy as a single enterprise is momentous. Likewise, Lenin's invention of the one-party police state as a way to make Marx's idea work is hardly less momentous. Stalin's resolute putting across of these two ideas, of course, did much to divide the world. With only these differences, however, the East and the West could most certainly still live in peace. The real, basic difference, however, lies in the religion of immoralism. Invented by Marx, preached fervorously by Lenin, and carried to unimaginable extremes by Stalin. This religion of immoralism, if the red half of the world triumphs, and well it may, gentlemen, the religion of immoralism will more deeply wound and damage mankind than any conceivable economic or political system. Karl Marx dismissed God as a hoax, and Lenin and Stalin have added in clear-cut, unmistakable language their resolve that no nation, no people who believe in God, can exist side by side with their communistic state. Karl Marx, for example, expelled people from his party for mentioning such things as love, justice, humanity, or morality. He called this soulful ravings and sloppy sentimentality. Today, we're engaged in a final, all-out battle between communistic atheism and Christianity. The modern champions of communism have selected this as the time. And ladies and gentlemen, the chips are down. They are truly down. Lest there be any doubt the time has been chosen, let us go directly to the leader of communism today, Joseph Stalin. Here is what he said, not back in 1928, not before the war, not during the war, but two years after the last war was ended. Quote, to think that communist revolution can be carried out peacefully within the framework of a Christian democracy means one has either gone out of one's mind and lost all normal understanding or has grossly and openly repudiated the communist revolution. End quote. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Can there be anyone tonight who is so blind as to say that war is not on? Can there be can there by anyone who fails to realize that the communist world has said the time is now? That is, is the time for the showdown between the democratic Christian world and the communistic atheist world? Unless we face this fact, we shall pay the price that must be paid who wait too long. Six years ago, there was within the Soviet orbit 180 million people lined up on the anti-totalitarian side, there were in the world at the time roughly 1.625 million people. Today, only six years later, there are 800 million people under the absolute dominion of Soviet Russia, an increase of over 400%. On our side, the figure has shrunk to around 500 million. Sorry, I, I meant to say 1.625 billion. In other words, in less than six years, the odds have changed from 9 to 1 in our favor to 8 to 5 against us. This indicates the swiftness of the tempo of communist victories and American defeats in the Cold War. As one of our understanding historical figures once said, quote, When a great democracy is destroyed, it will not be from enemies from without, but rather because of enemies from within. The reason we find ourselves in a position of impotency is not because our only powerful potential enemy has sent men to invade our shores, but rather because of the traitorous actions of those who have been treated so well by this nation. It has not been the less fortunate or members of minority groups who have been traitorous to this nation, but rather those who have had all the benefits that the wealthiest nation on earth has had to offer. The finest homes, the finest college education, and the finest jobs in government we can give. This glaringly true in the State Department. There, the bright young men who are born with silver spoons in their mouths are the ones who have been most traitorous. I have in here in my hand a list of 205, a list of names that were made known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless are still working and shaping policy in the State Department. As you know, very recently the Secretary of State proclaimed his loyalty to a man guilty of what has always been considered as the most abominable of crimes, being a traitor to the people who gave him a position of great trust, high treason. He has lighted the spark which is resulting in a moral uprising, and we will end only when the whole sorry mess of twisted, warped thinkers are swept from the national scene so that we may have a new birth of honesty and decency in government. All right, so that is McCarthy's oh, wheel damn. speech. They don't make them like they used to, boys. No, they do not. Great game, great shout out by him. Siding with Joseph McCarthy is not a popular opinion. I fucking will, boys. We're not afraid to be daring here. And I'm, a fucking, I'm a fucking and captain, Twitch Paul. Of course, I'm not afraid. I can't wait for this video to get no traction on YouTube. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Before McCarthy, nothing happened. I want to make that clear. So we showed all of the things that were coming up leading up to McCarthy. But let's get into the fact that in 1939, Whitaker Chambers reported Alger Hiss. 1939. He went up the chain of command and reported them. Well, what happened? Hiss was promoted and then made Secretary General of the United Nations. I want to repeat that again. He was reported as a known communist, and he had evidence. He had documents proving that, which we'll later, later talk about in the Pumpkin Patch Papers. Man, history sure does rhyme. <laughs> he, we, Truman knew about it from the FBI. There was reports from other people, from Whitaker Chambers. Spies correlated this. The Venona Project correlated this. We had, we had interceptions, documents from another person, and testimony from spies, all that had, that had move over. What is the United Nations? What? No, he's saying, so what? It's the UN. It's like, it's worthless. I mean, yeah, but I mean, right in the I beginning, during the, a lot of policy. during the Cold War, in 1945 and again in 1946, J. Edgar Hoover named Dexter White as a spy. Twice he went to the president and said, we've got communications, we've got spies, we have documents. 
proving that Dexter White, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, is a spy. And what occurred is that Truman sent him to be uh, the chief uh, individual for the United States for the International Monetary Fund. Then he went on to co-found the World Bank. And then he went on to um, do the, um, the Brentwood Initiative or the Brentwood Compromise. He was basically in charge of like the world's money and banking systems as a com as a known communist spy to Truman. He didn't care. He said, quote, sounds like a fairy tale. And uh, look how damaging the IMF and World Bank have been. The response? They've crushed a bunch. Of, they've, they've crushed up and coming countries mm -hmm. back into poverty. And what was the response to Chambers report? Fired and investigated. Over and over and over again. Not by the FBI, but by the State Department. But he was a you, fucking trooper. You know, who, was being, who was being run by people like Alger Hiss. Right. Communist spies. Little fun little tidbit before this. Before Joseph McCarthy, a young congressman from Massachusetts gave a speech warning of the dangers of communist infiltration of the Roosevelt administration. It was John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was the one, was the first person in Congress to really start screaming about infiltration of the Roosevelt administration and top levels. Nobody cared. So McCarthyism begins. We just read his speech. And McCarthy begins his fight from 1950 until 1957 when he dies, hounded by the media, constantly censured in Congress, investigated, the media is coming after his family, lies. <gasps> Russian-backed journalists are just making up things about him constantly. He has a gambling problem and an alcohol problem. Kind of something that happens to tail gunners that make it out of World War II, I think, and all of that stress. He dies in Bethesda, Bethesda Hospital. And there's no autopsy conducted. We don't have a cause of death. We know that he went into the hospital sick, and we know that he died. And we know that there's no autopsy. This is the same hospital that Forstall dies in. We'll talk about Forstall later. But this is the same hospital that his friend, Navy General, who fought communists and eventually was forced to resign due to media, and then ended up in a mental institution, where he died too. We'll talk about that death. James Forstall, Secretary of the Navy. Sorry, I thought I said general, but secretary. I apologize. So, he fought to keep funding in the Navy. The State Department, for whatever reason after World War II, was heavily, heavily invested in defunding our military. They said, look, the war's over. We got, like, we got to, we got to, like, make our economy strong again. What we got to do is we got to make sure that we heavily, heavily, heavily Get rid of all these ships. Just abandon these ships. And many ships were. But he fought. to, and, and tanks were just left in places. Military equipment was just left to be captured by whoever was there at the time. Like, they, you know, the troops were reduced. Our military funding budget was drastically cut. At the that sounds like Afghanistan withdrawal, huh? Mm, at the behest or of... Or Vietnam. At the beh yes, at the behest of the State Department and the Treasury Department. But it didn't happen so much to the Navy. The Navy didn't get defunded as much because the Secretary of the Navy, James Forstall, was like, fuck you, communism's a threat, we need a strong Navy. Like, these motherfuckers are crazy, this isn't gonna just go away, we, we gotta do this. And he, he made sure that he, the Navy stayed clean. Throughout all of these investigations, until he's excised, there's no reports of high-level high level Navy officials being communists. This man was a friend to Joseph McCarthy and made sure the Navy fucking stayed clean. As far as we know, Navy never had a fucking problem. Well, he well, kept... Well, just not with that particular issue. Right, you know. Seem to remember them letting a certain Haddon Clark in. Yeah, I mean... In terms of McCarthyism, all right? So... Curious what LBJ knew about JFK, right? 
Um, fought until media campaigns forced him to resign. He was constantly hounded by the media. He was attacked, lies on all end, and eventually he was disgraced so much by the media. Like, if you throw enough things at somebody, eventually some of them will stick. He, he, his family broke apart. He ended up divorced. He ended up resigning from the Navy in shame for nothing but lies told about him by the media. What kind of, like, what's an example? Like, what oh, kind that, of he, stuff that, he they a, that he had a homosexual relationship with a bunch of people, that he was cheating oh, on okay. his wife, that, um, that he was embezzling money. Like, like it was just like, it was literally the everything. That, yeah, yeah. Just the usual lies as much as they could. And under the best way to die is shotgun, under mysterious circumstances. So shotgun blast the public with like as much as many claims as you can. And like a couple of them are going to hit. So he goes a little bit crazy because he's like the communists are trying to get me. The communists are trying to get me, you know, that, you know, I'm the only one that can stop the communists. And so he, he begins to realize like my mental state's not good. I don't feel good. I'm going to check myself in a mental institution. He was not committed. He went to a mental institution voluntarily. While he was at the mental institution, the same hospital, Bethesda Hospital, in which Joseph McCarthy died and never got, um, went in, uh, went into for like some like health issues and died in the hospital with no autopsy being conducted. In that same hospital, James Forstall dies, presumably from committing suicide by jumping out of the window on the 16th floor, except all of the windows in the mental institution had bars on them and were under lock and key. We're presumed to believe that he went crazy, stole keys, got access to a window that didn't have bars on it, and then jumped out and committed suicide. Sounds right. Sounds sounds a lot like what happened to uh, a guy in the early days of the CIA. I wish I could remember his name. He wanted to quit, and uh, for some reason, he jumped out of a hotel window that night. Yo, yo, Kyle, are you in the fucking Discord? I need to know, dog. Did you join the Discord? You did not join the Discord unless you were already there. Get your ass in the Discord now, dude. You know your shit. He already said in chat tonight that he's in the Discord. Oh, fuck. All right. He's just been, he's been careful lurking. A lot of people like to do that. So he said to McCarthy, quote, if they were mere, and I, I love this line. You know, there was a bunch of, there was a bunch of quotes from this guy. Um, when I was looking at some of the, um, Stefan Molyneux stuff, cause he's got a bunch of stuff, uh, like multiple videos, interviews with, um, with, um, a, a woman that wrote a book about like communist infiltration, of the education system, etc. Um, he says to McCarthy something that I think is really important. He says, if they were merely stupid, they would sometimes make a mistake in our favor. That was like, that was like an aha moment for Joseph McCarthy to realize that the state department is not full of idiots. It's not government ineptitude. This has to be communist infiltration because they're not making any mistakes that help the American America in the cold war. Every mistake they make, is to help Russia over and over again. Whitaker Chambers. Whitaker Chambers joined the Communist Party in 19... somewhere in the 19 teens. Okay? But in 1938, after realizing the horrors of Stalinism, he leaves. Okay? He's like, this is fucking not what I thought it was. I'm seeing it in practice. He becomes an anti-communist. Now, at the time, he is working with Alger Hiss as a communist infiltrator. He is passing documents to, um, to Moscow. Okay? Okay. He is passing documents to Moscow. And... He's making sure that like, you know, that like, like he's he, sorry. He, I got distracted by chat and I, I stumbled. So he's passing documents to Moscow for Alger Hiss. That's work, you know, you know, before he's secretary general of the, of the UN or, you know, the, you know, fucking in charge of the UN basically. Um, 
And so he tries to convince, he's friends with Alger Hiss. He tries to convince him. He's like, dude, look at what's happening. Like he has several chats with him. And then he realizes that Alger Hiss is a true believer. And it doesn't matter what happens. He's always going to fight for Russia. And he's always going to fight for Moscow. And he's always going to fight for communism. And so what he does is he snags up a bunch of documents. And he stows them away. He makes copies of those documents. He keeps, the, he keeps some of the originals of some of the communications from Alger Hiss, okay? And he, and, he, and he holds on to him. He reports multiple times to the State Department, but the motherfucker is like number three in charge of the State Department, so he can't do anything. He tries to speak to the FBI. The FBI is like, you know, the, you know they They're don't like, want to talk know. to him. Right, and they don't even want his fucking documents. So he saves the documents and says, okay, well, I got all the fucking documents, so I'll go to the fucking press or something. I'll be a whistleblower, but I want to I want to step away. So he steps away because he realizes it's like in his mind, the whole government is run by communists. Like it's over. I'm just going to live my life in peace and I'm going to have all this blackmail information. So if Alger Hiss tries to come after me or somebody tries to come after me, I'll blow the fucking whistle. Basically blackmailing Alger Hiss to leave him alone. But in 1948, again, two years before McCarthy's February speech in, Wheel in, in Wheeling, uh, West Virginia, he testifies before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Okay? Now, he testifies and says, look, I got proof. I got all this shit. Alger Hiss is a fucking communist. I, 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 you know, I can prove it. Like, he is a communist and he works for Moscow. Well... All of Hiss's buddies that don't know that he's a spy, all of his buddies that don't know he's a spy, no, you can go ahead and chat, go ahead. I just like some, you know, some, I, it, it takes a while, but, you know, streamers got to do a stream. ADHD. I'm ADHD sometimes. Don't, what, what, what? You got to bring up my bone disease and ADHD. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, at least bring up my big dick while you're talking about all my fucking fucked up things. You bring all three of those up all the time. It's fine. They know. I really don't bring up the, the latter that often. But anyways... So, Alger Hiss is forced, right, to basically file a libel suit against Chambers. Because if he doesn't file a libel suit, you know, he he basically admits it, right? If he just lets this guy claim that he's a member of the Communist Party and a Russian spy over and over again and testify before Congress, and he just goes, I'll let him say his piece. He's got nothing, right? All his friends are like, dude, file the fucking libel suit. Like, what are you doing? Like, you need to fight this. So he does. Well, the media goes after Chambers. They besmirch his brother, who had committed suicide when Chambers was younger, and say that's because he was a homosexual, that he killed himself, and that he was a disgusting homosexual, and he deserved to die and kill himself. Um, they, they go after him, after, like, his career. They try and dredge up everybody that has anything negative to say about him. Um, they like basically call him a grifter because, you know, and that he's the real communist because he admitted that he was a communist and that what he's trying to do is destroy America by destroying Alger Hiss and claiming that he's a communist when everyone knows that he's not. But he takes two, he takes two, he goes with two investigators, okay, into Maryland to a pumpkin patch, all right? And with these two investigators from the House Un-American Activities co Committee, he brings in them like under under guard. He goes into a pumpkin patch and they find a pumpkin that he had carved and hollowed out and dried so that it was in the middle of a pumpkin patch and opens it up and pulls out the original documents. These have become known as the pumpkin patch papers. Okay? Now he brings the pumpkin patch papers to the committee and exposes the pumpkin patch papers and the FBI begins investigating. What they're able to do is get handwriting experts proving that it's his that it's Alger Hiss's handwriting that is in between direct communications between Moscow and Alger Hiss. But even furthermore, it takes a while, but they track down the signature of his typewriter. And they're able to match the typewriter with the paper and documents and parchment, knowing that it was typed on Alger Hiss's typewriter and that it was his handwriting on the documents. Okay? Even more so, hilariously, to this. Well, not to this day because he's dead, but Alger Hiss claims that he doesn't understand how uh, Whitaker, Whitaker Chambers snuck into his house and used his typewriter. 
but he admits that it was his handwriting on those documents. Wow. Right? He did this as a means of protecting himself from perjury, but it doesn't matter. He was charged with perjury. And this is when the domino, this is the big domino that falls, right? Because now you have all these secret things going on in the background. All these secret things going on in the background, like FBI investigating, Congress doesn't even know about it, right? Like, you know, there's rumors, JFK gives a speech, but like, for the most part, it's kind of thought of as like conspiracy theories. When Alger Hiss- The Alex Joneses of Congress. Mm Mm-hmm. When Alex Hiss, or sorry, Alger Hiss gets convicted of, of, of perjury, it's no longer like a full-blown secret anymore. And America's panicking because Alger Hiss is at the top of the State Department. Okay? And if the State Department has communist spies in it, where are the communist spies? And the and, and you also gotta understand the House, um, you know, the, the House Un American Activities Commission committee is like proving that like media and Hollywood is full of communist spies paid by Moscow. And now we know that they're in 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 the now we know that they're in the State Department. The call to like investigate this shit is just waiting on somebody to do something. So of course, in steps Joseph McCarthy after having friends, after getting documents from two different sources. He's like, "Yeah, I'm here and I'm ready to investigate. Let's fucking go. We're getting rid of these goddamn commies." Another important figure because, of course, you'll say, like, oh, this was just him. He was on a witch hunt all, witch hunt all by himself, right? Elizabeth Bentley. Elizabeth Bentley was a communist spy. Okay, not in the State Department. Like, a legit fucking spy. Like, secret agent type shit. Fucking working, you know, like, fucking, uh, what, what, what do they call those? Birds or whatever? You know I'm talking about they made a big movie about it. I don't fucking know. They, they, she's a legit fucking spy, right? Except... She accepts Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Okay? She has a religious experience and turns to God. Once she turns to, to, to like, God and, like, Christianity and, like, fully develops that ethos, she immediately goes to the FBI. Says, look, I want to defect. I want to defect, and I want to turn on you, and I want to give you names, and I want to give you evidence. She goes to the FBI and she reports 87 spies in 1945, including Alger Hiss, to the FBI. Now remember, this is like four and a half years before the, the Whitaker pumpkin patch papers and the investigation come forward. The FBI knew. And of course, J. Edgar Hoover's telling Truman, hey, dude, one of the top people in the State Department's a communist spy. We got documents from the Venona papers. And we got spies corroborating with the documents. Or at least we got reports. Sorry. I, I Let me back up. I said that completely wrong. That's not true. They had reports from other people and they had the spies. At this time, the Venona papers are not like transcribed enough to corroborate her story. I apologize. The other thing she does is she gives $2,000 in cash, traceable cash, from her handler. And says, this is money paid to me by my handler to be a spy. So not only is she, she's not just randomly showing up, she's showing up with like proof that like here's traceable money that you can trace back through banking systems to my handler and to other people. Here's 72, uh, here's 87 spies. Hoover put together a team of 72 FBI agents to investigate. Eventually, decrypting the Venona papers, they confirmed Bentley's story plus the $2,000 from the handler, right? So eventually the Venona papers show communications between Moscow and our and the spy networks prove and corroborate the same names that um that um Elizabeth Bentley gives to them or at least a, a large portion of them including Alger Hiss enough to probably uh take the whole list as gospel right so let's talk about the Venona documents so there's a book. I haven't read it. I really want to check it out. Um, I'll probably read it at some point because it seems like a fascinating read. Um, but all of this information is coming from Harvey Clare, is a professor of Emory College, um, about the Venona Secrets. Okay? The book is called The Venona Secrets. So the Venona documents, also known as the Venona Project, also known as the Venona Papers, right? 
it is kind of like the final nail in the coffin that proves unequivocally that Joseph McCarthy was right. Like there's there's no argument whatsoever because now it's no longer he said, she said. It's no longer like the occasional document. It's he said, she said, occasional document with an entirely separate project of intercepted Moscow communications that confirm the exact names that these people are saying and what documents they have. Like, it's as good of evidence as you're ever going to get. Okay? Now, in 1943, the U.S. began decrypting Soviet transmissions. Now, it's really important to understand how this works. So, basically, on a daily basis, or, like, for, for you know, daily communications, right? The, the Soviets would use a different key. So, it's kind of like the, um, the, the um, oh, what's the computer thing that Alan Turing broke? The Enigma Code. Right. It's kind of like the Enigma code in the sense that but it's not an, it's not the Enig there was no Enigma machine. It's just that they were using a different code and a different key every day. OK. And then uh, they uh, they'd use number stations. That's how you kept track of like what the the mission, uh, not the missions, the transmissions were. Right. But they would use a different one each day. Right. And so early in the war, we couldn't decrypt it. Like, without the key, you really can't decrypt it. I mean, maybe our modern computers could conceivably now, maybe, right? But you couldn't decrypt it with just, like, because the key was different each day. So without having the key, you couldn't do anything. But towards the latter half of the war, right, got a little lazy. They started using the key, the same keys multiple times. Then there was enough information, right, to discover what the key is, basically with mathematical analysis of, like, you know, most common letters, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so once once they used the same keys a little bit, they were able to decrypt it. To this day, only 3% has been decrypted of, of like of transmissions and codes that we were able to get out of all of them that were like we were being found. We got 3%. Now, in 1944, Finland, sorry, oh no, sorry. I said Finland's OSS, but I meant Finland from the OSS. Um, working, working, working in, was it Belgium, I believe? Sorry if some of the details are a little hazy, but he offers to sell, um, like, from Finland. Sorry. Back up. I'm getting tired and weird. Let me, let me just bloop, back up. Finland's OSS, by the same name of our OSS, offers to sell the State Department some 1,500 codes that they had gotten from the invasion of Russia. They had a bunch of material that would help us decrypt Russian communications. The Secretary of the State, his number two man at the time in 1944, right? Number two man, his aide, Alger Hiss, they recommend that we reject it. No, 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 no. There are allies. Like, we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be trying to decrypt Russia's communications. There are allies. Like, don't buy this information whatsoever. You know, like, no, 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 no. Like, don't do, like, no, we can't do that, right? But the director of the OSS basically tells the Secretary of State and his aide, dude, go fuck yourself. I'm buying this, right? Like, like we, we're the CIA, except we're not the CIA yet, but they're basically the CIA, and they're like, we're going to fucking buy this shit. Like, there's no fucking way we're not going to know what the fucking Russians are doing. Right? Was that uh, Wild Bill Donovan? Um, No. Uh, oh, yeah, it was Donovan. Yes, Donovan. Sorry. Yeah, Donovan was a fucking wild child. Yes, Donovan. Donovan says, like, and, like I was like, wait, what? And then it clicked, and I was like, oh, yes, it was Donovan. So Donovan is like, no, go fuck yourself. We're buying this shit. Like, we want to know what the fucking Russians are doing. So it includes wiretaps and trans the, the Venona documents isn't just transmissions. It's also wiretaps that like the OSS had set up as well. So some of it is the CIA doing it. Like, I hate the fucking CIA. I hate the fucking state, but credit due where credit's due, right? The OSS was tapping communications and giving that information um, on the Venona project, um, which, you know, was then, you know, eventually that information made it to the FBI. Right. They shared that information with the FBI to try and make sure that the FBI could rid people out of the State Department. Right. Not the whole 9-11 shit where nobody's talking to each other. 
And so what these documents show is hundreds and hundreds of communist spies in academia, in the government, in journalism, in Hollywood, etc. But importantly, in academia and in the government were like some of the, the biggest ones identified, especially ones that people didn't know about, right? Because in Hollywood and in journalism, it's kind of easy to follow the money trail, right? It's a lot easier to figure out like who's getting money and they kind of have a right to do that. Whereas in education and government, you're talking about like payoffs to people that are in public positions. Like the, the waters are murkier on the legality and they're a little bit more secretive. And those are very important to Russia to make sure that they infiltrate communist philosophy. Thanks for the follow. Infiltrate communist philosophy into academia. The Bonona papers prove this. Well, Franklin Delano Roosevelt orders Donovan to return the decryptions to the Soviets. Tells him he's not allowed to have them because there are allies. And how dare you in 1944 be, be, be spying on our allies. And so by order of them, they do. Not all of them. <laughs> Against direct orders from the president, some people in the OSS, let's be honest, Donovan was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. make sure you make some copies of some of this shit. Okay, and it gets moved over to the Venona Project secretly, and it's kind of kept even away from the administration of Truman and FDR to a certain extent, that they have this document. So they're keeping secrets from the president at this point because they're like, who, Donovan's like, who in their fucking right mind is going to like re require that we give back our ability to decrypt the communications on the Russians? Like, that's just the dumbest shit ever. Of course we spy on fucking communist Russia. Well, FDR also, and so they're eventually returned to Soviet ambassador Andrei, uh, and I don't know how to say his fucking name. That's his name. Andrei Gromyko. What, however you say his name, he's given the documents back. And we do lose some of the documents. It was only some of it that were able to, like, squirrel away. And then the White House, under FDR, told them to stop Project Venona. Said, cease making de um, decryptions. And Truman kept that policy all the way through his presidency. Truman, even during the campaigns in the House, even after communist spies were found in um, in the State Department, okay, he's like, no, 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 don't look at the Venona documents. That's spying on our allies. In 1952, he still thinks it's wrong to spy on the Russians at least in some regards, or he thinks it's a waste, or he thinks it's a fantasy, whatever fucking reason he gives. Truman's a fucking communist sympathizer as far as I'm concerned. In 1949, again, before McCarthy's speech, a code breaker was able to decrypt a message in the uh, uh, from another document source, part of a Nona project, kind of like secretly squirreled away from even Truman, that shows that the Moscow had direct lines and tap and 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 on communications between Winston Churchill and Truman. Winston Churchill and and President Truman were not able to speak or or have communications without the Russians knowing exactly what they were saying. Of course. And of course, the biggest revelation from the Venona documents was Dexter White. Dexter White, who was the secretary assistant to Yo, what's up? I'm fucked up, rich boy self. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> what? Who the fuck bought like uh, bought a fucking program to try and get them views and like get their YouTube subscribers so that they would just spam random people shit? I'll just time him out for now. If he comes back with another spam, we'll ban we'll ban him. All right, so biggest revelation was Dexter White. Okay, it proved unequivocally that Dexter White, who was the secretary assistant to the, uh, was the, uh, sorry, the assistant to the secretary of the treasury. Okay, number two guy in the treasury department. There's one person between him and the president of the United States, and he is a communist spy. What did he do? He went on to design and co-found the uh, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and then was the was the head of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Now, remind me again, what was the Bretton Woods Agreement? What effect did that have? 
Um, it basically tied um, the entire world economy to the U.S. dollar, supposedly tied to gold in some way, and made us a lending institution for Europe. Oh, right. That one. Yeah. Yeah. It basically, it, I mean, that's the reason why Nixon went off the gold standard pretty much. Yeah, because they came to collect and realized that we weren't on the fucking gold standard to begin with. And then Nixon officially took us off the gold standard. Man, I guess that bot really wants to... He, he, he PM'd me, bot. please let me know, let, let him know I'm not spam, I legit political and getting into libertarianism. Yeah, but you, you came in like a fucking bot. Uh, so... Enjoy your five minute timeout or 10 minute timeout. And, you know, if you want to DM me or something later or join the discord and DM me, you know what I mean? I'll check your shit out. But if you like do like an immediate like welcome to the channel, you start spamming your channel like I'm going to time you out. I just assumed you were a bot. All right. The project itself was infiltrated by Soviet spies. This is really important to understand. The Venona project itself had multiple Soviet spies in it. That's really important. And we'll get into it a little bit later. It might be the next slide or the slide after. It's really important that you understand that none of the Venona documents, even when we were kind of like secretly decrypting them, right, could be used in any of the trials because they were secret. We didn't want the Russians to know that we had them. Except they knew. <laughs> they were in on the project. They knew exactly what we knew. So they probably pumped a lot of false info. Yeah, and here we go. J. Edgar Hoover worried releasing the Venona documents would, like, alert Moscow, right? He was like, dude, if we if we let them know these documents, then they'll know that, that like, we've intercepted their communications and shit. Except they knew exactly what we knew. What they didn't know is that William Weissband was a Russian spy, and he was a linguist at the very top of the project. One of the leaders of the project that was a linguist that was helping transcode these things was a Russian spy. And every single solitary thing that they knew in the project, he was reporting back to Moscow saying, hey, they know about this. Make sure you get this guy out. Make sure, you, you know, this person, ah, we can sacrifice that person. You know, let, let, let them catch that person. Ooh, they don't know about, do they know about this yet? No, 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 they don't know about this yet. And so it was a complete moot point that we never actually released the Venona documents until 1995 is when they were declassified, by the way. Um, we never released them because, like, we were worried Russia would know, except they fucking knew. And what it did is it crippled the House Un-American Activities Committee and it crippled uh, McCarthy. I don't think, I mean, like, from everything that I know, I think J. Edgar Hoover was, like, a legitimate believer and wanted fucking commies out. The only good thing he ever did, I guess. The FBI investi investigated and removed some spies with secret documents leading credence to Red Scare. Now, what do I mean by this? Because they, the other effect of not releasing the Venona documents is that it worsened the idea that there was a witch hunt from the government. Because the government is using secret documents that are inadmissible in court as the pretense to begin investigating random people, right? And so, like, the public, all they see is they see, you know, and, of course, you got communist propaganda. Um, you got communist propaganda from all of these publications that are owned by the communists, and they're, they're screaming civil liberties. They're screaming that the government is going after people without any evidence whatsoever. And, of course, it appears that they have no evidence whatsoever. They can't say... No, we got a fucking warrant to go through your shit because we have proof that you communicated with Moscow on 15 different occasions. We have proof right here that this is your handler. So we want more evidence. So what they had to do is they had to go after and they had to find other evidence in order to bring them to trial or to do anything. And on, on top of that, because the Russians already knew what was going on in the Venona projects, all of those people that were that were likely to be investigated were tipped ahead of time. To destroy whatever documents to get rid of anything so they knew to cover their tracks even better than they might already be doing and we couldn't use those things in court so it made it look like witch trials because they have like because to the outside they're not finding anything on most of these people and they're just going after them accusing them vehemently of being communists it's almost a comedy of errors 
if, if the outcome wasn't so bleak and tragic. So, during his second speech to Congress, um, okay, I don't, did I, did I grab that? Oh, yeah, I looked at it and was like, ah, it's not worth reading. During his second speech to Congress, right, and when I say his, I mean Joseph McCarthy, everyone was demanding that he name the names on the list. Joseph McCarthy said, quote, if I were to give all the names involved, it might leave a wrong impression. If we should label one man a communist when he is not a communist, I think that it would be too bad. Not the most eloquent statement, but, you know, better than Trump. <laughs> and so there is this myth that he went after innocent people when, in fact, his speech was interrupted 123 times. And he still refused to give any names when he brought the list to Congress and instead gave case numbers. He made sure that every individual that, that he was claiming needed to be investigated, that he protected their identity, and that he did so by referring to them as case numbers and not by names. I have no idea what that is, Canadian pioneer. I'd probably want to, you know, hurry up and find that, though. What is it? It's a twenty-two long rifle. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, you would that or report it to the police immediately. Is it no, a coincidence? Communism is intentionally atheist. You can't be a Christian and a communist because it's impossible. I mean it's a it's a it, it's a it's a communism is a is a is a moral vision. You can't have conflicting things. I mean, like, communists can have conflicting shit all the time, but you just can't. That's for the glory of the, the usurping communist state. Mm -hmm. Lavender Mafia doesn't count. They're not really Christians. So, so speaking, oh, speaking of the Lavender Mafia, we're going to have to do a follow-up to this about McCarthy and Cohn going uh, in their lavender scare. <laughs> oh, we can if you want, but that's not what I want to, that's not what I'm focusing on here. So, McCarthy was right. The fallout. So, his false list was debunked immediately. And that's what you'll hear from other people. That list was debunked like, you know, the State Department came back and investigated it and found nothing. That's State literally... State Department, where like the top, the top number two and three people were active Communist Party members. And agents. Well, spies, yeah, they weren't active party members. But yeah, so they investigated themselves and found nothing, and that's the argument that his list is wrong. He gave out 110 names, 62 of which were still in the State Department. By 1951, state, the State Department, other individuals, right, had done a more thorough investigation and investigated 49. By 1954, 81 of the 110 had left either because they resigned or had been fired. Forced resignation or fired, not retired. 81 out of the 110. After years of investigations, constant dismissals, John Stewart's service was fired in 1951. Yay! Do you remember John Stewart's uh, 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 service? I'm sorry, I don't. That is the guy that was investigated in 1945 because he gave Amera Asia thousands of documents. The, the, oh, right. right. Sir. Yes. So finally, in 1951, he was finally fired, guys. Isn't that amazing? The Supreme Court reinstated him in 1956. Uh, he was then say, he was then brought up as uh, American counsel to England, and then he became a faculty member of UC Berkeley and a New York Times columnist. Well played. Work, he is a professor and faculty member at UC Berkeley with a uh, specialty in Asian political well, studies. Funny. So what you're saying is he's a very wealthy communist. Is Quinn Zhu Zen? I don't know that. I don't. I, that's one I'm missing. I don't, you know, you're going to have to tell me about that one. You're going to have to tell me more about the Chinese side there, Kung Fu. Owen oh, Lattimore. Remember the Lattimore proposal I talked to you about from the State Department, right? He was yeah. in... He was a named spy. McCarthy, he was one of the named spies on the list. Except it got leaked to the press. They blame him for targeting him, but it was leaked by the press. The only reason he used his name in the closed meeting was because it was a closed meeting that the press wasn't supposed to hear about. 
Owen was cleared of all charges until, a, you know, because, you know, nothing wrong. The State Department cleared him of all charges. He's perfectly fine. But in 1952, the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee charged him as a Soviet spy using he documents. Known as a sissy. Right. Using documents, using documents, using uh, testimony, using um, like uh, witness testimony from other people. They were able to put together that he was a Soviet spy and they fired him. So remember how we talked about how he ruined these people's lives by bringing their names up? Well, he then became a professor at Johns Hopkins. And then under the Kennedy administration, he was a liaison in Mongolia. And God, then he, really, Kennedy? Fucking really? And then he headed a Chinese, uh, a brand new Chinese studies department in 1963 at University of England. And he retired in England, a wealthy professor. Of course. A ruined life. That's what I expected to hear. I don't know why I put Hatch Act of 1939. I knew that this was going to be here the whole time. It's 1946, and I apologize. But from well, 19, you go ahead and change it. Well, because if I because I'd have to exit out a slideshow. Oh, fair. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so I just want to point out this date is wrong. It's 1946, not 1939. I uh, it was a struggle to put this together, boys. Uh, from 1953 to 1954, McCarthy headed investigations into 114 government employees, and it was all to enforce again. The Hatch Act of 1946. This was illegal. You're not legally allowed, much less espionage and being a spy and like, you know, government documents and everything. It's illegal to simply be a communist. <laughs> Fuck you. And be in the government. And be, and be a government employee. Not anymore, but you know, it was then. So what happened? Well, the State Department became stricter and dismissed 4,000 employees. For one reason or another, most of whom obtained government jobs elsewhere. So they just spread the cancer. Yeah, they spread the communist uh, party members and cancer because there were because you're not actually charged with anything per se. And even when you are charged with anything, there's no teeth to the Hatch Act. You just you just get fired. You don't get com you don't like you, you can literally give money, get money from Moscow. But if they can't prove that you gave do government documents that you just gave classified information oh well then you're fired you can go work somewhere else in 1954 Otto Otepka State, uh, State Department security specialist he put out a report where he found 1,943 suspicious personnel individuals that had things in their records that seemed to you know that, that were like you know suspicious personnel doesn't necessarily mean they were communist spies right it just means that they had like a lot of discrepancies Things weren't right with them. Their behavior wasn't right. And this has been like documented as individuals that like might potentially be spies. He later told a Senate committee that 722 of them, quote, left the department for various reasons, but mostly by transfer to other agencies before a final security determination was made. So they could quit and go get a job elsewhere and the investigation would be complete. You wouldn't even have to worry about a continued investigation. They could just go work for another government agency. Jesus Christ. During what a, what a pointless fucking law. Well, I mean, it's only as good as the enforcement from the executive branch. And Truman didn't do shit. Neither did Kennedy. But I'm sorry, guys. He was the great fight against communism. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Joseph McCarthy from 1953 to 1954 maintained the identity and secrecy of 653 witnesses. Only those who refused to answer and were state officials were brought before public hearings. If you worked for the government and you answered his questions honestly, he kept your entire identity secret. I want to make that clear because they say that he dragged people out in public to ruin their lives. No, all of these people had been had been uh, interrogated secretly or in closed meetings, and they said they refused to self-incriminate. And because they refused to self-incriminate, that is reason enough to fire them under the Hatch Act of, of, of 1946. Because it's not a criminal situation. If you can't confirm that you're not or never have been 
tied to or a member of the Communist Party or a Nazi party, right? Then you're not allowed a government job. Communists are not allowed to be in the government. Why? Because they want to destroy the government. Like you, like Marxists and fucking hardcore radical leftists want the destruction of Western civilization, the destruction of Christianity, and the destruction of all liberal democracy. They want the glorious revolution. You can't. You literally can't have a functioning government with Marxists in it. It's. He was just enforcing the law, and he only brought people that refused to answer before public hearings so that everyone could see that they refused to answer so that they could be fired for being fucking communists. Right, Policy Walker? I think we know where all of those people went. In the Department of Education, there's a whole nother section. There's a whole nother book that, that, that uh, I, I can't remember the name of it, but um, Stefan Molyneux does another interview with her where she talks about like academia and all of the spies that heavily infiltrated. There's hundreds of of communist spies took over in the 1950s um, academic uh, institutions. Communists have, like, paid communist spies have been in colleges since the 1950s and even the 40s. Um, that's just a fact. And the Venona documents show that as well. But there's no end screen. That is, that's everything, boys. That was a fucking journey. I still, you know, the pumpkin papers is my favorite. Yeah, that one, that's pretty fucking great. The fact that, the the fact that, um, oh, I'm sorry. The fact that he took them, Whitaker Chambers took them to fucking, took investigators into a fucking pumpkin patch to a preserved and hollowed out fucking pumpkin and stuffed original documents in there to hide them because he knew the fucking commie spies and everybody and the state department it's communist spies and the American state department are both coming for you. Can you imagine the fucking terror? I, uh, I wonder how he waterproofed it. I don't know. Fucking bag. <laughs> like plastic existed in the fifties, dude. But, you know, that's fair. You just watched a clip from our Twitch channel, Fabian Liberty. If you like content like this, please like and subscribe here on YouTube. Or go ahead and give us a follow on twitch.tv backslash Fabian Liberty.